All right, guys, welcome back to the Good Hustle podcast. Today, we're going to be diving into the current housing market here in the greater Harrisburg area. Of course, you have me and John, and we're going to be talking about all the stuff we're seeing going on in the market because, okay, so here, here's the thing, okay? Everybody watching this has seen some kind of hysteria or some kind of crazy stuff in the news about, you know, the housing market is going to crash and, and what is going on in the housing market. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of stuff that's, that's a little clickbaity out there that you're going to see. Um, but you're looking at two guys who work all the time in this housing market here in the greater, greater Harrisburg area. So, um, you know, with that being said, I kind of want to ask you, John, what, what has been your experience lately in the housing market? Well, it's funny that you say that it's going to crash because we talked about this in our first episode. <laughs> yeah. This is your third year. Yes. And every year you've heard the same exact thing. Every single year I have heard, oh my gosh, the market's going to crash. And I, I still have people that, that tell me, hey, Zach, like, look, I'm really interested in buying a house at some point, but I'm going to wait until the housing market crashes, dude, because we all know it's coming because I've seen, I've seen 28 TikTok videos this week talking about the housing market crash. And yeah, it's it's a little exhausting. Yeah, it is, and it's in its media, it's clickbait, it's everything that you kind of said. And there's a lot that goes on. There's a lot that goes into our market that people just don't quite understand. That affects actually interest rates, inventory. You know, people don't understand how big the rental market actually puts pressure on the actual housing market and sales. Yeah. So, what I've seen, it's a kind of a repeat of last year so far. Mm -hmm. Rates have leveled out a little bit, which is good. They didn't go down quite as much as we were hoping so far, but they have leveled out. And it's funny because I'm actually seeing people are getting to the point now where we're so far past those 3%. It's kind of like a norm now. Yeah. And people are really feeling that. Yeah. But it also, at the same time, prices certain people out of the market. Mm -hmm. So I'm working with some buyers right now that we're looking at some numbers and this and that. We're going back and forth and ultimately what they thought they could afford, they can't. So they're kind of yeah. backtracking, going back about thirty, forty thousand dollars and saying, hey, this is really where we need our budget to be. Right. But that being said, I wrote an offer two weeks ago on a house in the borough of Camp Hill and there was 12 offers on it and yep. cash one. <laughs> yep. And there's houses that <clears throat> go live in different markets because we are very market specific in this area yeah and by market specific i can talk about smaller than townships like you oh, can yeah. go to a township and then find a specific market there that's going to be different than one three right. miles across. even a specific development with 10 houses in it 100 percent, right yeah you're right i mean it's funny because i actually i was doing comparables on a listing that i'm listing this week and i went back and there's been one house sold in this entire neighborhood which is not a small neighborhood in the last 390 days Wow. Yeah. That's it. So inventory still low mm -hmm. and prices are still going up, but not in every single area. They're just not. So you might, like I said, two minutes ago, you might find one that's in, you know, market A that had two price drops already yep. and has had no offers. And then you go three miles over and you got 12 offers and four of them are cash and it sells for $50,000 or for list price. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, um, so you brought some kind of national numbers to kind of paint the picture on what the housing market has been doing in the past year. Do you want to go over some of those? I'll even go further back because okay. what year were you born? 1995. Okay. So not jealous. Um, <laughs> so let's kind of go to back, flash, <laughs> flashback 1995 in the housing market versus today. Okay. Okay. So 95 <clears throat> annual existing home sales was 3.85 million. Wow. Okay. Last year was 4.09 million. Okay. But our population went from 266 million to 336 million, which is almost like a 33% growth. Wow. And that existing home sales did not grow 33%. Yeah, not as it would, close. Yeah, it would have been closer to 5.1 million, and we're at 4.09. So single family inventory of December of 95 was 1.58 million. 2023 was 870,000. So that Jeez. went way down. That's almost half. Yeah. Month supply then was 4.8. Then in 2023 was 3.1 month supply. Now, we did talk about this a little bit earlier. What was our month supply in this area? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give a little spoiler because we're going to talk about the local numbers too. But um, our month supply of inventory in December of, of 2023 was 1.4. Yep. And do you, know, do you know what 
Yeah, it's very, I'm sorry to interrupt, but there you go. do you know what a balanced market's supposed to be in month supply? <laughs> so I, I've i only ever really studied our market very well. Yeah. Um, I've heard the rumors that it should be like four or five or something. Six like months, that. basically. Six months, yeah. Yeah. I mean, anywhere, I mean, we would love to have a four month supply. Folks. <laughs> I know, we would yeah. love it. That would change our world. Uh, sellers sure. might not love that as much, <laughs> but it makes for a much even market and a yeah. much more even playing field for buyers and sellers, which is really important. Yeah. Um, and then <clears> if we go to the median, Annual existing home sale price, 1995 was 114,000. Adjusted with inflation today would be the value of 227,000. Wow. 2023 was 389. 389. Yeah. So Goodness. that makes the biggest difference. It's mind boggling what you can and can't afford from 1995 till today because of inflation, interest rates, lack of inventory, which is basic economics, supply and demand. Yeah. It's just, it's tough. People say, well, it's a bad time to buy. In my opinion, it's never a bad time to buy real estate. Mm -hmm. You should always be investing. I mean, I think it's like 90% of millionaires. On real estate, yeah. Their number one investment is real estate. Right. And they're, they're not stopping buying just because interest rates are high. Yeah. And the one thing that I have noticed about a lot of the current buyers that can afford the homes, A, they're either cash buyers mm -hmm. or B, they're baby boomers. So they were used to 1980s rates, which were 12, 14, 16. So when they see a 6%, it doesn't bother them. Yeah. Or they can put a lot of money down and lower their rate. Right. Or C, we do have actually an uptick in first time home buyers in the first time in like two years right now, which is, or three years, which is really good. So it's showing that our market is evening out a little bit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's a, uh, the man, the nineties to, <laughs> to today is such a, a shell shocking thing. Um, so let's go over some of the local numbers here. I printed out one for for you too, John. Um, so let's talk about the last year here in, in the greater Harrisburg area, okay? So in December of 2022, we have 394 units listed. That means new houses that were listed. Um, this year, December of 2023, we have 360. So we're not seeing a very big difference. We have 30 less houses basically listed. Um, the listed median, the, uh, the median price in December of 2022 was 229,000 ish. In this year, we were at 254,000 ish. So that's that's a pretty good increase there of like 20, 30 thousand uh, dollars. Month supply of inventory, like we talked about, this has kind of stayed steady the whole year. We had 1.1, 1.2, and now we're at 1.4. Um, so that hasn't changed a lot. Um, units sold, we have about 30 less that that tracks. Um, the sold median was about 10 thousand dollars more than last year. Um, and the days on market, meaning how long a home has stayed on the market, went from 22 to 24. So, uh, and this is this is for uh, three counties. It's for Perry, Cumberland, and Dauphin County specifically here. Um, and and so so this is kind of painting the picture to me. Um, and this is this I'll ask you how you feel about this, John. But I'm the reason I'm bringing all this up is because in my opinion, things have stayed very very similar over the last year. And I remember saying that same thing the previous year. From, from 2023 to 2022, um, which I think is good and bad. It's it's good in the way that we're seeing some kind of stability. You know, we're coming out of a of a really tough time for the world. And so to have this kind of stability in the housing market is, is nice to see. We're seeing that very steady thing you love to see on on a graph of the line going slowly up over time. We, we love to see that when it comes to house prices. You want your home to appreciate over time. Um, you don't want them to spike like crazy or go down like crazy with that because that causes a whole lot of instability. So we love to see that the, the graph is going up a little bit, little bit, little bit. Um, but I think it's bad for, um, for, for one reason, and that's because we're still in this weird, funky market where things are, the right kind of homes like you were talking about are sitting for maybe 48 hours, maybe. maybe. Like, if they're, like if, they're, if they're listed properly, if they have great pictures, if they're listed a little under market value, they're gonna get a cash offer in 48 hours and, and that'll sell fast. And so a lot of people, first time home buyers especially, are not gonna have a chance to, to buy those properties. Um, and then the bad kind of stuff, the stuff that's, um, you know, needs a lot of fixing up or or has been sitting for for a little while, that kind of stuff will just, will just kind of hang out on the market. I think our actual month supply of inventory is growing a little bit only because we have so much bad inventory, if you wanna call it that. That's yeah. been sitting around for a while. Yeah, you're right. And the one thing that I will say that is that is trending up a little bit, if you look at last year, January, the current inventory was 643. Mm -hmm. Now today's the 24th, we're at 698. So we still have seven days left. We have a whole week left. Mm 
-hmm. and we're ahead of last year, which that makes me happy because that means that we, there's still a chance to add some more to that. So the inventory has gone up a little bit, which does make me happy because that's a good little trend. Like you're saying, when you're seeing those little graphs go up and up and up. Yeah. But at the same time, you're right. The really nice houses, the ones that are staged correctly, the ones that are in good shape. They're Listed really, by a good realtor like like John Henry. Or 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 Michelle Snyman or Zach or any yep. of us or Trent. Right. Or anybody in our office, technically. Yep. Um, but they're really, really hard to get your hands on if you're like a first time home buyer or yeah. you're a five percent down buyer. Or if you have to do some kind of financing like USDA or mm -hmm. VA or something. It's like tougher. That. Yeah. Now, once again, good news is I've seen way and we can talk to any one of our lenders, like we use Angie or Jeff Arnold, Angie McMichael. They'll tell you they've gotten more and more FHA, VA, USDA, right. and PHFA deals in the last three or four months than they had in the last three or four years. Yes. Or three years, which is great news. Mm -hmm. So there are really good trends that are happening, but at the same time, a lot of it's the exact same it's been for the last two years. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, so, so addressing that one more time, I think the, the thing that I really want to convey to our listeners on, on the good hustle here is that, um, in this market, if you're a first-time home buyer, if you're a young person, I work with a lot of young people. Obviously, a lot of people that are just getting into the housing market they they haven't done this before. Um, it really is going to take some hustle to be able to get that first house. If you're looking at all this stuff with the beautiful pictures that just dropped on the market recently, like that, that is gonna that's gonna take some hustle. It's gonna take. We're probably gonna go out and see stuff, you know, six hours after it drops on the internet, and and we're gonna have to go see it that night. Um, and it's also gonna take some some work on our part to. Um, you know, be competitive. We might have to waive things we don't want to waive, and that's just you know the nature of the beast right now. Uh, yeah, and and it, with that, we have new documentation we have to fill out now. Yeah, yeah, through our office because we have to protect ourselves as agents as well. And it just it's not the way you want this market to be, but it's the reality of how it is. And even like you were saying, more hustle. Like yeah. Some of the stuff you have to do that first time home buyers or young people didn't have to do five six years ago was huge deposits. Oh yeah, good faith deposits because you could do. Two hundred thousand dollar house, you could do a three thousand dollar deposit. Yeah. Now it has to be like ten right. if you even want to compete. Yeah. And that's tough for a lot of younger buyers. Right. And so, and and we'll get to this later on on how um, I think first buyer, first time home buyers can win in this market. I'll, we'll talk about some of our strategies on how we can be successful in this market um, later on. But here's here's something else I wanted to address with you on the pod, uh, John. So we mentioned a little bit of hysteria earlier and and how. Um, you know, we, me, me and you both see a lot of the time where, where there's people putting out videos and, and saying things on the internet that are just like, we just have no reason to believe them. And of course, one of them is the big housing market crash that the people have, it's been the boogeyman in the background for what, like three, four years now. And just staring through a window. Yeah. It's, it's just like, just like waiting for every, uh, you know, home price to come crashing down. Um, so I think we should address how we feel about the housing market crash or, or or lack thereof. Um, so, so do you want to go first on that? Yeah, I mean, it's an election year. Yep. So tendencies tend to tick up a little bit because obviously current um, administrations want themselves to look good. That happens almost every year. Yep. Gas prices will hopefully go down. Bond market will go up. Interest rates will go down because the bond market and interest rates directly affect each other because right. they have the same investors. Mm -hmm. So if the bond rates go up, the interest rates go down. The bond rates go down, the interest rates go up. So we want more of an even playing field when it comes to that. But I don't see a crash happening. And by the way, if you're enjoying this episode of the Good Hustle Podcast, please go ahead, like the video, subscribe. And also, if you need any real estate help here in central Pennsylvania, John and I would love to help you. I know there's a lot of people that, like you said, they clickbait because they want to scare you. Yes. And that's a lot of mainstream media. Right. It's still going to be a tough market for a lot of people. It's still going to be hard for younger buyers, which I, I hate to say that, but it's the truth. Yep. If you're not prepared, and most public schools and schools don't teach you how to prepare to buy a house by the time you're 22. Yeah. Well, and also, you, like, you don't have you don't have a house you've had equity in for 20 years. Like, no. Like, you can pull cash out of, you know, like you're... And just starting out, so yeah, I bought a house. Uh, we bought a house, excuse me, two years ago. Mm -hmm. I bet you my equity's gone up thirty three percent. Yeah, I already have equity. Which, by the way, young people listening to this, like pe people, people who are uh, looking for their first house and stuff, hear that. Hear, hear that. You know, it's really, really important to start that cycle of getting equity in a home and, and actually, you know, putting money into something because, like, like if you don't get out of the rent cycle, you're never going to be in that position where you have. 
thirty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars to get grow into your next house or or buy an investment property or, or something like that. And that's some of the people. I think they're going to be a little bit quicker to make a decision to sell this year because mm. most people for years, the last three years, like, I don't want to sell. There's nothing to buy. I don't yeah. want to sell. There's nothing to buy. I mean, how many times have you heard that? Oh yeah. I've heard that a thousand times, but I think there's going to be more people that are going to be willing to sell because they have so much equity. It's like, well, where am I going to move? Right. Well, look at all the equity you have. You can reinvest that into another property. It's going to get even more equity in the future. Mm -hmm. And I think selling that to potential buyers and sellers and making them understand where their equity comes from, where it can go, how you can use it, you know, talking to a proper CPA about, you know, tax benefits, about investing in real estate, 1031 exchanges. These are all big things. Yeah. And I'm dealing with a buyer right now. He's 23 years old and he's already got money saved up and he's ready to go. Mm -hmm. And those aren't your typical buyers right no, now. No, they're, they're not your typical <laughs> young people. Yeah. I wasn't like that. I didn't buy my first house till I was, I don't know, 20, Eight, twenty nine years old. Yeah. That was your age. How old were you? Uh, I was twenty six. Yeah, twenty six years old. So that's ahead of most people. Yeah. I mean, I. No, had, we were really blessed to be in that position. Yeah, I think I've had, I don't know, a handful or two of buyers under the age of twenty two in my entire career of eighteen years. Mm -hmm. So I think young buyers, hopefully watching this podcast, start turning their wheels and help them maybe move forward and talk to that lender because the hardest phone call. <clears throat> really for anybody to make as a young person or even at my age is like, let me talk to a mortgage person. Cause yeah. it's scary. It's a scary phone call. It yeah. really is. Yeah. Here's, here's, here's one thing I want to address as far as like the crash or, or the market changing drastically. Um, the, the thing that I always say is we don't have, it, it's not that it's not that it's impossible. It's that we don't have reason to believe that it's going to happen right now. We don't have reason to believe that there's going to be some kind of drastic change. In fact, we've re we've reason to believe the opposite. We're we're seeing um, interest rates kind of flatten out. They're they're not going down drastically. They're not going down even at all. We've we saw a little bit of an uptick this last week um, of where the interest rates are kind of flatlining at around around six percent. Um, and home prices have continued to do this. They've continued to just do their old school thing of of going up over time. We've, the only time we've ever seen home prices drop drastically was in what the the housing market crash was in two thousand eight. But that was the only time we've ever seen. In the history of the housing market, prices do this. So we don't have a reason to believe that's going to happen. I mean, there's been small drops, but nothing like that. That was a crash. Yeah. And that's when I started. Right. It was like, whew, I, I hated listings. Yeah. When I first got in the business, like, oh my gosh, I don't want to list a house. Yeah. There's 8,000 listings out there. And I'll tell you, I was looking at it last night. Our average market, we used to have a thing called Paragon. That was our old MLS. Before and, Bright. Yeah, before yeah. Bright. And it was basically York, Perry, Cumberland, and um, Dolphin County, we'd average 3,300 listings at a time, mm -hmm. roughly. So I went through last night, if you just do Perry, Dolphin, and Cumberland, there's like 900 listings. Add York, there's 1,600. Yeah. Half. Yeah. Half. Yep. That's mind boggling to me because you used to be able to go in and just you know pick and choose. Let's go look at this one, this one, this one. Yeah. Like, eh, we don't want that. Nice houses, you could just wait days, wait weeks look at it be like all right let's put an offer on it we'll <laughs> offer them 30 grand less it's like that does not happen now we i went and showed a house the other day and uh it was in rough shape mm -hmm. and we put an offer together thought it was pretty fair and another offer came in cash over list price just, oh my god i can't believe that that just happened yeah john i had um there's there's an agent friend of mine who's been in the business about 10 or 15 years and she let me know she's like zach before the pandemic happened I had never lost an offer before. <laughs> I had been in my career just strolling through, getting every single house I wanted for all of my clients. And like and like you said, it was very much like, okay, so we're gonna see eight houses today that are all beautiful. You know, it's they're gonna be your pick. They're gonna give you whatever you want on the on the offer. Just offer something. Um, and you just you just pick and that, you know. But but on the on the flip side of that, selling was a lot harder. Yeah. It time. was. And I and I was I was young. And I was afraid to list houses because I was like, why is my house not selling? Why is my house not selling? I was like, oh my gosh, I'm just so scared of the heck out of me. <laughs> but now it's like, I will put a sign in the yard. But and then the other thing is people are like, oh, you just put a sign in the yard. I still make sure my listings are 110%. Yep. Like it has to be done correctly. And we, I remember I was sitting in the office, I, of course I remember it was yesterday, but with Michelle and, and Trent, and they were going through a lot of stuff to get this one listing ready that they thought was going to be ready for today. 
Mm-hmm. And it wasn't quite ready. So Trent's out there shoveling snow and Michelle's making phone calls oh, because we still take pride in our business. Yeah. And we still want to make sure we're doing everything the right way for all of our clients, whether it's buyers or sellers. And not everything we can do for buyers is necessarily the way we want right now because inspections are out for a lot of people. Yep. But it's kind of the way it is. I, d- I did want to kind of talk about Keller Williams of Central PA and how it's outpacing the market. So they posted these stats a couple weeks ago. It's a comparison round of December 22nd versus 23rd, mm-hmm. or versus December 2023. Mm-hmm. So, and this is just Bright MLS, our little area. So closed units, Bright MLS was down 4.4%. Keller Williams, up 39%. Yeah. Closed volume, down 6.6%. Keller Williams, up 31.2%. Listings taken up 6.5, which is good, which means there's more houses on the market. Keller Williams up 50.6%. Listings taken 4.5% up. Keller Williams 15.8%. Listings sold down 4.4%. Keller Williams up 50%. And then listing sold volume down 6.6 and uh, up 46.5 for Keller Williams. That's crazy. Now, we've added more agents, but we're adding a lot of quality as well. Yeah. And I can tell you the first few months of last year compared to the first month of this year are night and day for me. Mm-hmm. Now, and I talk about this, I'm not afraid to share. I was also going through depression. I was struggling mentally. It was t- trouble getting up in the morning, um, you know, ebbs and flow of, you know, mental illness that I carry with me. And that was tough. Yeah. I don't have it as much this year and I feel like I'm working harder, but a lot of that has to do with the people that I'm hanging around with as well. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, of course, you know, I'm a KW agent too, and I, I can attest to, I, I think KW does a really good job of attracting the right kinds of people who want to grow and, and want to do good things and want to be there for their clients and stuff. Um, so what do you say? Here's another big question that I, that I get all the time. What do you say to people who are like, well, you know, it's looking like now this year that rent is finally starting to become cheaper than buying again on a month to month basis here. Um, so I think I'm just going to keep renting, um, you know, for the foreseeable future until there's some kind of huge change in the housing market. Um, homeowners are worth, I think, statistically, I think the number, I'm good with numbers, so I remember it, 43% higher. They have more worth, 43% more worth yeah. for retirement, everything, than a renter. Yeah. I mean, it's there's never, in my opinion, a bad time to buy real estate. You are investing in your future. This area is not going to slow down. In the United States last year, there's different market statistics for this, but in the U.S. last year, five of the top 10 markets were in central PA. Reading, number one. York, number two. I think Cumberland County area was like number five. Lancaster was number three. I'm talking about in the entire country. Yeah, Lancaster's been growing a lot too. It has. So if you want to invest, come here. And I was just talking to an agent that sells new construction, six of their last seven buyers weren't from here. Yeah, They were from Arizona. They were from California. They were from Connecticut. And they weren't moving here for any reason. They just know it's a great place to live and invest. They weren't coming here because they had grandkids. They weren't coming here because of a new job. Right. They were coming here because this is a great place to live. Yeah, And there's people that move here from really nice areas. And they're like, yeah, I love it here. Mm-hmm. And there's people that move back that had gone... I, I talked to a friend of mine yesterday from high school and she's lived in, you know, New York, North Carolina. And she's like, moving back here has been awesome. It's yeah. an awesome place to grow up. And it really is. I've lived from Orlando, stayed in Paris for a couple summers, yada, 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 but yeah. came back here and this is home. It's such a nice place and it's such a great place to invest in real estate. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah. I, if there's, if there's one myth that I could dispel for a lot of people is it it please do i i just i don't i don't know how to get it through to you know a lot of the people that i talk to um because i talk to a lot of young people i talk to people that um you know we we play video games together and all those kind of things and they'll they'll it's really easy on paper to look at and be like okay well if i move to this rental unit it's going to be eleven hundred dollars a month but if i move into this house i buy it's going to be like fourteen hundred dollars a month so isn't it an obvious better decision to just move into the rental unit. And, and it's so hard for me to, I feel like I have to jump through a lot of hoops to just be like, well, okay, look, look, look. Over the next five years, you are going to pay down that loan that you get on the house. 
and this home is going to appreciate. And that chunk in the middle there is called equity. And you're going to have like twenty dollars or $30,000 easy in five years that you wouldn't have had in a rental unit. You're also going to own this property. You can paint it however you want. You can, you know, change out the bathroom if you want to. You can, you can, you know, put a shed in the backyard if you want. There's, there's all of these benefits to owning property, and it's really hard for me to get through to some people who are who are just looking at that monthly payment. Yeah, and it's not taught. It's not taught properly. And the the bottom line is, it's do you want to pay your own mortgage and your own investment for your own future, or do you want to pay for somebody else's? Mm -hmm. Whose do you want to pay for? Do you want to invest in yourself? Or you want to take your money, invest it in somebody else, and never see a dime? Right. It's that simple. But for people to understand that, it's hard. And you know, fair to you know, fair enough to a lot of these buyers, three hundred dollars is a lot of money a month. Of course, yeah. And it stinks. Yeah. Because of the price of inflation, and I mean, I it's mind boggling. I go to the grocery store and I can get two bags of groceries, and I'm something eighty bucks. I'm like, what the heck? Yeah. It's like, what did I buy? I have a buddy, Matt. He puts posts on Facebook all the time and you have to guess how much his groceries cost. And then you get a <laughs> gift card to his restaurant, of course. But oh. but it's like you put this little amount of groceries up. It's like three items. I'm like thirty three bucks. Yeah. Like and I'm and I'm probably off by five dollars, like yeah. short. Right. It's just mind boggling and I feel bad because yeah. people have to go through and nickel and dime everything because of how inflation has happened and it, it affects everybody. And yeah. I just hope that people like you said that you're dealing with or even that I deal with mm -hmm have the ability to invest in their own future. Yeah. They really do. Yeah. I think there's there's one other thing I want to touch on that you said in there is that um, you know, a lot of people today, um, you know, it, it is really tough to to get that first property. That is that is probably the biggest hurdle because after that you can move equity into property to property to property, um, you know, if you if you invest in your primary correctly. Um the thing I wanted to touch on is is that a lot of people, I, and I see it online, and I, I know some of you guys have done this, all right? I know we've talked about this before, is we'll, we, there's a little bit of, um, of complaining going on about, you know, how the older generations, well, they have, you know, they have these homes that, you know, they pay $400 a month for that they got in 1986 or whatever. Oh, yeah. And the, the question I always have for people is, how do you think they got there? Like, at some point, that $400 was a lot of money whenever they bought their house, you know? So, like, if you want to be that person in... 30, 40 years where you're paying $1,500 a month, but everyone else is paying $5,000 a month in 30 years or whatever it is, you have to start somewhere. You have to eventually get that first property. You can't just, you know, keep renting and, and cause, cause rent over time is going to go up, but your mortgage won't. Yeah. And I mean, it can go up slightly because of taxes, but that's right. It. Yeah. Very slightly. But it's funny. Cause I've, I've like seen these memes where it's like, you know, a uh, baby boomer shows up, uh, had bought their first house for you know, eight bucks and a goat, and now they're selling it for uh, 1.6 million. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it's like a, a 800 square feet. They but got it for four bananas and a coconut. In. <laughs> 100%. And it's funny because right. I'm looking at some of these. I was looking at, somebody sent me, uh, Taylor sent me a Denver listing. It was like 800 square feet. It was like 1.6 million. Oh my gosh. Like just this little teeny house. In Denver? Yeah. Holy. Like, and people wonder why people are leaving yeah. certain areas. You yeah. can't afford to live there. No, that's, and that's... this is still a very affordable area to live. We don't have the lowest taxes. There's some states that have much lower taxes, right. but ultimately we don't have that high of taxes on our property. So you yeah. have school and county, but it also depends on township. People are like, well, I wanna live in this township. And that's the one thing that people aren't taught as well is about how our taxes work with millage rates, how it goes by townships only. Yeah. So you think, well, CV, you know, people have an opinion. I'm not allowed to give mine legally, but people have an opinion. <laughs> That's a great school district. Yeah. So the taxes must be high. Not true. Very low taxes. Right. So Hampton Township, Silver Spring Township, very low taxes. Mm -hmm. So these are other things that go into the process. We went looked at a house that with a high tax millage rate, and it wasn't affordable. But you could look at the exact same value home, the next township over, and the payment might be two hundred fifty dollars less a month because of taxes. Yeah. And that's crazy. Yeah. The tax stuff is is wild when you break it down and and the the other thing that i hear all the time is like oh well it depends on the school district and and where you're at but also like it depends on if the school is big or small like I, i've seen a lot of a lot of variance based on if you go to a smaller school where like there's only you know 10 houses that'll fund a slightly larger school or something like that and then you know the taxes go up and that that kind of stuff can get very in the weeds very fast but um i guess let's let's end it this way okay um we can just take turns on this what is your advice for how buyers can win in the market right now? You really have to be creative. You really have to find an agent that's gonna hustle. 
Right. You really have to understand that if you don't have an experienced agent or an agent that even is new, that's working with an experienced possible team, it's not easy to win if you're not going to be creative with your contract writing. So the agent you're working with better know the contract and better know how to win by using certain sections of the contract. Cause it's not just about price. It's not just about settlement date. Deposits a big thing. Inspections are a big thing. All that stuff. Time is time is of the essence is big. Mm -hmm. So making sure you're working with somebody that's well rehearsed in our contract is super important. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, for, for my piece of advice here, um, I want to speak to my first time home buyers quick. So there's really two roads before us. Okay. Road one, we can go see some of the competitive houses that are right around $200,000 that have beautiful pictures, um, that are going to sell in 48 hours and we can bid on those. Um, but we're going to have to bid over asking price. Um, it's going to get a little hairy when it comes to, um, appraisal gap payments and inspections and things like that. Um, or road number two is we can look at the stuff that's been sitting on the market for 14 days plus, and we can go in there, we can get them inspected, we can get them appraised, and we can make sure that we do our due diligence on those properties. But they might not be in perfect condition, they might not be the prettiest, it might not be, you know, HGTV. Um, but those are kind of the two paths before us, we can pick either one. Um, and I have strategies to win on either one, it's just, um, you know, one is going to be a lot more competitive, and we might have to take some losses as we get there. Um, but those are kind of the two roads before us. Yeah, and people, especially like road two, yeah. that's sweat equity, whew. Man, does that go a long way? Oh yeah, with with the value and how much you're going to get with a return on investment. Because understand, like you are buying a house, but a one a it's an investment. Right, you're investing into your future. You're investing into the future of your family, and that's what's most important to understand throughout this process. Yeah, and so I guess uh, advice for sellers then. So what are what are you seeing in the market? I mean, it's not it's not really that hard to win for sellers right now. But what are you seeing to to make that that extra added value for sellers right now? Uh, correct photos is always important <laughs> Yes, because the, and pricing correctly. Like if you're going to say, well, the comps are 380, I want to list at 420 because I know it's going to sell that. That's not going to work. Yeah. Like you're going to lose out by doing that. Price it at 380. You might end up going for 420 then. Yeah. If you price it at 420, it might sell for 390. So my biggest things for a seller is make sure you're getting correct pictures done. Make sure proper marketing online and make sure you're just working with an agent that knows what they're doing. Simple as that. And if you do, you will win every time. Yep. Yeah. And my uh, last piece of advice here is estimates are not what your uh, appraisal is going to be. Um, <laughs> so, be, so be very careful on estimates because uh, that that is uh, I, I I love I love all the people around here, but for some reason people think estimates are are very legitimate, and it's it's you know sometimes we have to dispel that one and just say look, that's that's an algorithm. It's on the internet. They don't they don't really know. So and I and Jeff Arnold and I did a commercial on that. Estimates aren't accurate. And most likely, neither is credit karma. So understand <laughs> what a lender, whether you're buying a car or you're buying a house, the credit score they're seeing is not the one you're going to see on credit karma. So what he's saying and what I'm saying is trust the professionals. Yeah, trust the professionals and, and make sure you do actual due diligence. And the internet is not always right, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, so if you have any questions or you're looking to buy or sell a home, just talk to Zach or I or anybody on our team and we're here to help. Yep, and uh, find your good hustle. Ha, ha, ha.